pleasant evening and a warm welcome to the special discussion held on the 30-year journey of Honorable Minister of Finance, Mangala Samaravira. He is a dreamer who believes in development through democracy and reconciliation. And today, to discuss on his journey, we have two very important guests in the studios. Initially, we will start with Professor Rohan Samarajiva. Welcome, sir. Happy to be here. To start off the discussion, Professor, if, me, if I may ask you, what is his personality as a politician? Well, you know, I got to know him when he was 42 years old. I was 44 at the time. Uh, this was in 98. I had one meeting with him before I accepted the invitation to return to Sri Lanka from the United States and take on the job of uh, Director General of Telecom. He was an unconventional politician. I mean, I couldn't actually believe. Usually, you know, you get old, very dignified looking people and he was, you know, breezing through rooms and uh, it was a completely different uh, kind of approach. Uh, persona that he projected. And what I found very interesting was that uh, given all the exciting things that we were doing in telecom, he was also bringing people from South Asia. I can remember he convened a meeting of the ministers of communication of uh, SAC. Uh, minister Sushma Suraj, who's now the foreign minister, uh, was in charge of the subject at the time in India. So these people came on the, their officials came and they were like saying, you know, how come in this country you have young people running this sector? I said, it's a new sector, what do you expect? Uh, you know, that, that, the, the sector was different. Uh, we were doing things differently and somehow we seem to be different to other people as well. And as you said, he started in the mid-age of his, while he was a fashion designer initially, and forego his passion and then started off. In short time period, he achieved significant positions in the cabinet. What was his secret? Well, my sense is that he was given a not very important portfolio, uh, which is Post and Telecom. Honestly, that's not a very important portfolio. Wasn't until then, from independence. It was, you know, something that after all the big positions were given, irrigation and lands, foreign affairs, you know, those are the big ones, right? And then, you know, these were the junior positions. But after Mangala Samaria finished with it, it was an important position. People like being Minister of Telecom now. Uh, it's an important position. He made it important. Uh, when I met him, uh, he had just become Minister of Post, Telecom and Media. Three subjects. So in a way, he started with Post and Telecom, but, and I came to work with him on Telecom, but he had added the media portfolio. And I know something about media. I mean, I once was, for a short time in my life, even a journalist. And I taught the subject to some extent. So we used to have some interactions on that side as well. So if you talk about the drastic decision he took in privatizing telecom, how... Well, I don't think uh, people would, be, would say, you know, a single individual took that decision. You know, President Kumarathunga has to be given some credit for it as well. Uh, she took a, took a lot of courageous decisions with regard to privatizations and reforms at the time. The credit that I particularly give uh, Minister Samaravira is that he saw it as bigger than just a privatization. He saw it as having elements of introducing competition, elements of introducing proper independent regulation. So it's when you put the three pieces together and in addition, that you, you attend to, to, to change in the internal culture of the old government-owned uh, enterprise. That is when you get good results. And that is something we didn't see in all the countries. I mean, in Pakistan, they just sort of, to settle some debt or something, they gave that phone company to the Arab Emirates. You know, those are little piecemeal things. Here, it was done in a, in a comprehensive way. And I think that's why there's very little debate uh, people like to debate with me, but they never debate me when I say that the telecom sector has done well because everybody accepts that things were so bad before that and things are so good now. Uh, and I think uh, he should, I mean, not only him, not just him, but including, uh, you know, the, the people he had as, as his leader who was uh, 
uh, President Kumar Tunga and the officials, uh, his secretary, a whole lot of people should be given the credit. But clearly, this, this part of it was, was his. And his political approach, sir, if we may discuss, he's not the usual uh, politician that we see. He has taken several no democratic and liberalization. It was his core. So how was his approach and what is different from the other? I came from a university, right? I mean, university people, particularly the states, you know, we don't mess around with politicians. We don't have that kind of attitude. I mean, so I was a little worried about this. But, like, I think for the... F I come here at his invitation, and for a month he doesn't meet me. And I, I sent a message saying, does he want to meet me? And he said, no, no, no. So I got, the message, I got a response back saying, oh, that is, let him continue to work, and then we'll talk. So it was not like, you know, I, I invited you to come, you owe me... Uh, I want to give you direction. He, he had, you know, we had had a long, one long conversation. I don't know him, right? When he was, you talk about fashion designer and all that. So I have no idea about it, that period of his life. So once I was on vacation and somebody took me to, to see, see him saying, you know, they're setting up a regulatory agency and you do regulation. Why don't you talk to this guy? And I met him at the Sudunalum office. Uh, and I was also, of course, very interested in the peace process. Uh, so we had a conversation on these subjects and that was it right so uh, the fact that he was not trying to be very intrusive he had made his assessment that i knew the subject and he said better karagani and that's you know let him work and then we'll talk and i was free to do my work you mentioned about sudhanelum and he proves his social activism how how active was he he, he was working for the people he was well, very you know, much involved. by 98 uh, so I came in December 97. By 98, you must remember, 98 January was when the Dalada bomb went off. And I was looking back, you know, you can see the pattern. The Dalada bomb kind of took the wind out of the sails of that whole process. That was a very significant event. So quite a lot of the very hard, uh, energetic activity of Sudunelum had happened before that. But even after that, there were, there were organizations, you know, I can remember Mrs. Manohar Muttatuagama, Professor Gamini Kiravalda, um, various people, Jayanta Seniviratna. Uh, there, were, there were people who were working on this uh, to, to think more deeply about reconciliation. Because, you know, it's not stopping the war, it's not ceasefires that result in reconciliation. It's a, it's a longer term, it's people actually believing that the whatever solution that we came up with is the right solution. So I had this criterion in terms of well, actually explaining to my wife why I was disrupting our lives. Uh, we were living a perfectly peaceful, normal life there and I suddenly I negotiate leave and all that stuff and I pack off to Sri Lanka and they are there, right? So I had this thing which said, I said, I have two criteria and he meets both. Is he going to change the economic economy of Sri Lanka, because I really was unhappy, even now I'm unhappy, about how our economy is organized, right? I want her to change it. Second is, is this a guy who's going to work for peace? And peace, sir, durable peace, not just, you know, stopping and surrendering or something like that, durable peace. So he answered both, both questions. So when I came, there was that other part of it also that was going on at the same time, how to how to communicate this message. I mean, I can remember the Jaffna Municipal Council elections were being held. Uh, cricket matches uh, between Jaffna schools had restarted, right? So there were all these things that, and I was saying, you know, I mean, let's talk about this, how life is returning to Jaffna after Rivirasa. There was a big military campaign just before that, right? The breaking of the ceasefire, then the military campaign, the taking of Jaffna by the Sri Lankan forces. There were all kinds of things that had gone on. How do you calm the waters? And these were things that we used to talk about on that side. As an economist, what was his approach being the finance minister? How would have been changed? Would oh. be the reasons for the change in the economy? Now, the earlier period that I'm talking about, I mean, I was, I was part of that system, right? I'm an official during that period. When he becomes finance minister, that's in 2017, I believe, 
uh, I'm looking at it from the outside. I'm no longer in government. I've got my own think tank, and I'm people ask me questions, and I answer them on TV or wherever. And I actually liked the the the, the budget. I mean, I think they're like anything, right? I mean, there's a few flaws, and I did comment on the flaws uh, publicly. But overall, I thought it was a very coherent budget. The previous budgets, I had actually refused to comment on them because I said, you know, I think my short answer was my mother told me, if you have something negative to say, try not to say it. So I was very unhappy with the previous budgets. This one, I thought, made sense. So the issue is that we have seen the results of that. Now, of course, there was this unfortunate 52-day uh, problem, which has kind of thing, put things out of whack. But generally speaking, I think he has done a very good job as finance minister, and I was ha very happy to see him come back to that role. Again, not in a direct official capacity, but as an outside observer. For the media, his contribution, being the media minister, what do you see? His That's a tough, tough question. Because you see, our media system is quite imperfect, let's put it that way, quite imperfect. Both the state media and the, the private media, there are many, many problems in the way the whole thing is organized. Um, I can't say that in the way that he fixed telecom, he fixed the, the media sector, right? He didn't, couldn't do that. Uh, particularly, I think, given the, there was a war conditions and so on, uh, things kind of ticked along, more or less. But there were certain actions that I recall. I can remember there was a big fuss about uh, the phosphate uh, deposit in Epaval. And, uh, you know, the old story was the, how the state government media, state media would have dealt with it. Is There's no, no mention of any opposition, right? It's all good. The government wants to do it. There's no mention of it, no coverage for the opposition. With his, he took a decision to send crews out from Rupohini to the village of Epaula and put the cameras there. I mean, we didn't, he didn't ask them to come here to the studios in the village and did a program about their protests. Now, that's a very courageous decision. Now, me personally, I was hoping it would be handled better in the sense that we would have won the argument to actually uh, commercially exploit a power. I didn't think that the final outcome was something that made me happy. But the process was way better than the way we have handled some of these development-related protests. It was a much more civilized process. And I would even say unique approach to, to handling such a process. How successful has he been? handling all these important, significant positions, ministerial positions? Well, if you look at Post and Telecom, very clearly, you know, one of the most successful uh, reforms that people are benefiting on a day-to-day -day basis with the lowest prices, the greatest amount of choice, decent quality, and so on, is Telecom. Absolute tick mark. Uh, you, if you're giving grades, it's an A. Post. I know that he tried. I was talking to the people. He brought their consultants who came in, etc. But somehow, you know, between the postal unions and so on and so forth, that didn't get done. Uh, media, as I said, some innovative things were done, but structural change didn't happen. Maybe the time that he had was too short because I think he remained as media minister only till about 2000, and I had left by that time. Foreign affairs, very interestingly, I, I wasn't in the country. I left in 99. I wasn't uh, in the country when he became, uh, oh, then I had come back. But when he was foreign of, minister of foreign affairs, I wasn't directly in touch with him. But I, I distinctly remember the interesting relationship we had with, uh, with Minister Lakshman Kadragama, who many people argue was the best foreign minister we ever had. Uh, it was more like a, you know, um, a mentor-mentee kind of relationship. They were friends, but obviously Mangala was much younger than Minister Samaravira. And I've been at, uh, I mean, one of my me most memorable moments was there was some kind of dinner organized for the British, lots of diplomats. I happened to be at the table and right next to Mr. Kadiragam and opposite me was the British uh, High Commissioner. And I could believe this. 
we are having dinner in a very civilized manner talking about very very mon- mundane or you know things about literature and what clinton is doing and blair's thoughts and boom nakshman kadragama would come in and talk about banning the the ltt and then the conversation would go some hey, come back to this so I said, wow and he does it in a such an urbane and sophisticated way it doesn't seem crude at all but you could see the pressure that has been exerted on the british high commissioner by kadragama right so those are tricks of the trade how to do these things without sounding obnoxious but being persistent and i was say man if i could listen to some of these things i learn something right uh, because you know i'm 44 right i'm you know these are these are things we don't know about uh, this is not my field but i think wow that's pretty impressive and the point is i think that there was a kind of a student teacher relationship between uh, mr minister samaravira who was a young guy and uh, lakshman kadrigam and when he became foreign minister i think he must have used those skills of course both of them were very good with language their speaking is very sophisticated uh, and they can endear themselves to you when they are talking to you right both of them have that quality so those are very good qualities to have in a foreign minister if you are not comfortable with communication you can't do your job so i think that's why he was very successful and i can remember you know soon after this government came in and i used to be grilled on various tv channels what are their achievements and i used to say how about the fish gsp plus for fish immediately gsp plus for everything soon after uh, quite a lot of foreign uh, policy achievements um, were were done i mean in the same way that one would talk about lakshman kadragam how much he achieved as foreign minister i think mangala also achieved quite a lot uh, during his short period and that was certainly an informative discussion we had and we thank professor rohan samrajeev for being here today and do stay tuned we will continue with the second guest for the day and we'll be right back <laughs> Welcome back we are watching the special discussion on the 30 year political journey of honorable minister of finance minister mangala samaravira and uh, we just before we did the previous discussion it was professor rohan samrajeev who was with us and uh, you are watching the second segment of it and now we have uh, a veteran who who is known as a political critic um a well known journalist bilingual de- journalist mr kusal pereira with us welcome sir thank you To start off, if you may say how you first met Minister Mar- Samaravira. Well, I met Mangala way back in 1988, when he was after he was appointed the SLP organizer for the Matara seat uh, with Mahindra Rajapaksa. Mahindra and me used to very often meet Mangala, and that's how I. came to know him as a human rights activist he was instrumental in uh, floating the mothers front with mahinda as co uh, coordinators passionate worker i would put it that way very much committed to what he's uh, what he believes is uh, right and that was hard work that he did that time uh, i was also involved with mahinda with human rights campaigns so we were moving very closely and then 80 1989 for the first time he entered parliament and he proved himself a very sharp or very incisive uh, debater in parliament and he stood every time on democratic and liberal rights he i think very often likes to project himself as a true liberal uh, and uh, all through those years uh, i was having very close contact with mangala with mahinda we were into different protests against that regime under president uh, premadasa we went to many campaigns from kalambu to katragama padyatra were led by mahinda very much uh, a success mangala playing his 
own role organized in the whole Mathura district for that. And then the other campaigns. So it was a very politically active period with uh, Mangala during that period. 94, of course, he became a very powerful minister with uh, President Chandika Kumar Tunga. That period, I lost a little bit of contact with uh, Mangala. I didn't meet Mangala very often. But thereafter, again, uh, he became very close to me, and we were meeting very often. After his break with the SLFP in 2008, January, when he ran into a political conflict with the Rajapaksa regime and decided to leave on a very principled issue, which he very clearly and openly said what it was publicly. Thereafter, again into campaigns, he's a very hard worker, he's a very passionate campaigner. When he gets into something, he doesn't leave it till he sees the results. So that's how I came to know Mangala and that's how I understand Mangala. As a taskmaster, give him a job, he does it. As a person, uh, how is his approach towards his opponents in, in politics, that is, maybe politically and even at, in personal level, how is his approach? Well, one thing that I admire in Mangala is that he doesn't take political arguments and political debates personally. Therefore, he doesn't make personal enemies, but he certainly has political enemies on political issues. Uh, the best part is he never compromises on his principles. He says what he believes and is ever willing to call a spade a spade. He wouldn't go around. He would just very bluntly, very openly say what he believes. That in a way has uh, sort of antagonized political opponents, but not personally. In fact, Mangala doesn't take it personally. Maybe others do, but not Mangala. That much I know because I have also had very strong, very deep, uh, heated arguments with him. But that's that, then we have a small drink, we have uh, dinner and then we part off and then we meet the next day. So that's the best thing, very human that way. And uh, we have not heard about any political corruptions, you know, entangled with his name. How, how does he maintain this rapport? Well, this is something very interesting. See, he entered politics uh, when this whole system was opened up for uh, internal and external trade without anything, what we call the free market economy. And this free market economy I say is inherently corrupt and during the last 40 years it has become a massive corrupt system and for a person like Mangala to survive within the system without any allegations on corruption is unbelievable but he still does it because he personally does not get involved I believe I've not heard of Mangala getting involved in any wheeler dealing. So he maintains that cleanliness with him. But of course, he had to compromise with the system, being with this, within the system, working for the system. So uh, there is a margin of compromise, margin of giving in to the system, but maintaining himself as very clean, which is remarkable. And so you said uh, he's a man of principle. He sticks to his principles, policies. And what we currently very regularly see are the crossovers, which is very, has become a norm in the political industry. So again, he does not do it that often. And he, when he does, he has a reason for it. And he makes a statement, it's, it's, it has basis. How was that done and how is well, the discipline? crossing over, I don't, I don't, say Mangala ever crossed over. He didn't cross over as such. He ran into a conflict with the Rajapaksa regime. He fought that battle on principles and then he was made a backbencher and for him to be a backbencher was very uncomfortable. Therefore, he made that statement and then moved to the opposition. 
That I wouldn't call a crossover because the crossovers that we talk of today are all parts of personal deals where there's privileges thought of many, many things. It's this crossovers that are, we are talking of are all corrupt deals. That wasn't the case with uh, Mangala. So I wouldn't call it a crossover, but I would rather say that he changed his political alliance, gave up the SLFP, sat independently in the opposition, and subsequently joined the UNP, which he, as he said during his 30 year this, uh, ceremony that he had, as he said, uh, he felt more comfortable with the UNP policies and principles. And he said he felt that he was moving into the ancestral home. Uh, because SL, uh, SLFP is very much a mixed party. It's somewhat racist. It's some Sinhal chauvinism is the base. Uh, UNP was considered the more liberal party, which is more inclusive. And that fitted better with Mangala. So I think uh, to talk about crossovers with Mangala is not fair by him. And I wouldn't expect Mangala to cross over in the future as well. If he finds it very difficult to go on along with the UNP at any moment, he would make a very clear statement. And I now think he would give up politics at that point. But as it is, I think he has a future in the UNP. He has created himself as a very strong leader within the UNP who stands by what uh, the government wants. And he has worked for it. And for a person like Mangala, who has held the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, who has held the Ministry of Media, and now the Finance Ministry, is, I think, the three most important and the most powerful ministries. So he's a figure to consider, even for the UNP, uh, to keep him there. But he's worth keeping. How did his mother's uh, political career contribute, Mrs. Kema Samaravira's? Well, Mrs. Kema Samaravira, as far as I know, was not a very strong political activist. But she did, at one point, uh, contest the urban council matter and was a councillor. Her influence to Mangala is actually a very affectionate mother who wanted to bring out Mangala as a principled person, which he is, and his attachment to the mother. He was very fond of the mother. Mother was basically his center of life right throughout till the, uh, the demise of his mother, he was very much shaken for some time because I knew I was in and out that time. So that was the influence uh, more than politics uh, to <coughs> make Mangala a man of principles, which he is now. In several occasions, we see that he is being insulted in personal level, and but he is able to survive. You know, uh, going through this sling of mud. How, what keeps him going? You know, with the strength that he has. Well, it's his, his strength there is that he does not take them personally, but he tries to give them a political interpretation as to why he's being called names or why he's slandered. And then he makes a statement, he clarifies whatever he has to, and then moves on. So he's not a person who gets stuck in that. He doesn't want to. He, he has a vision, actually. So he wants to go on. He doesn't get bogged down with these small, small things, understands, he tries to understand them politically. He tries to explain that and clarify them politically and then move on. So that's his strength, going, ever going forward without getting stuck with these small, small slanders that is the general politics in this country. It's far above this general, very uh, popular politics. He's not a very populist. He doesn't play for applause. He doesn't play for the gallery. He moves on with his principles, and that's the hard life he has spent during the 30 years. And he has gained much uh, that way. And I think he believes that provides him uh, 
the platform that is looking for a political future. In the 2015 regime change, he played a key role. What was it like? He has always been, as I said, a taskmaster. And as a taskmaster, when elections are there, he takes over the campaign. He's a person who believes in mobilizing the grassroots. And he's one who can reach the grassroots. See, despite his very westernized uh, uh, sort of uh, lifestyle, he is also one who can sit with any ordinary man, any ordinary voter, talk, discuss, move around. He's, he's a very energetic character and very passionate in what he does. So he was instrumental in, the, in developing the campaign in 2015 and carrying it on. He was able to bring in many, many social segments into that, uh, the Colombo urban middle class, the rural voter, and he planned for all that. Even now you see that uh, this year, I see him planning for the next elections already. He is that. He knows where he has to go and he keeps planning. 2015 election also was that. He played a very key role. Um, he may not be the star speaker in the, on the platform. Nevertheless, he is the driving force in these campaigns. It was that even in 94 general elections. It was that again in 2005 presidential elections with uh, Prajapaksa as the presidential candidate. Hard campaigner, and that's his strength. And finally, if I may ask, you've known him for the f past 31 years. As a person, as a human being, who is he? A human being, a thorough human being, very much, very sensitive, although you don't see it. Is very sensitive for these issues. And for any small thing you call him, he responds. Mm. He's one person who is very empathetic, who can, who can feel the other person. So for me, with all the political debates, discussions, deviations, and all, with all that, he remains a very valuable friend and a human being to continue with that friendship. He's worth that very warm character. See, what most people don't see when we talk about the humanity in uh, the humanness of Mangala is the fact that he is a very aesthetic character. Obvious, he was a designer, but he's a person who enjoys music, a person who is very much knowledge about culture, and also a person who reads anything he can lay his hands on, which is something that most politicians don't do now. I see him very different that way because I had once a huge argument with him on Obama uh, when Obama was first time campaigning for his candidacy. And then when he returned from London, he brought me a book written by Obama about his father and said, Kusal, this is for the long discussion we had with Obama. And then when I looked, he had said for, he had put his signature and said, for an avid reader like me, for you. So that part of my, uh, Mangala is not very often seen by people. And that adds to his humanness. That was definitely a lot more that we have not heard about Minister Mangala Samaravira. And we thank you, Mr. Kusal Pereira, for being here for this discussion. It certainly told an untold story of the past 30 years of his life. And for you, thank you very much for tuning in to Channel I. And we conclude this discussion. We thank Professor Rohan Samarajiva, who has joined us in the previous discussion. And altogether, we wish all the very best to Honorable Minister of Finance, Mangala Samaravira on this completion of 30 years in his journey. Thank you and good night.